Welcome everyone to this special feature of Resilience in Challenging Times from Sounds True. My name is Tammy Simon and I'm here with poet, philosopher, and friend Mark Nepo. Welcome, Mark. Oh, it's great to be with you anytime, but especially now, Tammy. Yeah. During this time, you've been writing and speaking, and I want to draw forth for this conversation a couple of the themes you've been talking about that I think will be really helpful for people and helpful for me. One of them I want to start with it is that during this time of uncertainty and turbulence right here in the midst of COVID-19, the metaphor of a tree and that we can deepen our roots and expand our trunk and that when our roots are deeper and our trunk is thicker, we're better able to weather these storms. And I wanted to start here because I think it's easy for people, I think, to, con to connect to this image of a tree. The hard part is, at least for me, is at times to feel those deep roots. And I think for many of us during this time, it's like we feel ourselves, maybe to our surprise even, being whipped about by winds and storms. We're like, oh my God, I thought I had deeper roots actually than I can feel right now. Mm -hmm. So my question for you to start us off is how do we deepen our roots during this time? Well, I think, thank you. I think that um, the, this whole metaphor of the tree has been a teacher for me because <clears throat> it really affirms this is why we need an inner life. This is why we need practices. And the thing that's happening widely for all of us, me too, is that when we meditate, when we're quiet, when we calm ourselves, that's all practice for now. <laughs> you know, we use that, you know, I, I think of uh, Derek Jeter who retired, you know, the great Yankee shortstop, you know, thousands and thousands of ground balls, all for the one time in life. The practice is, to use in real time, which is not <clears throat> clean or messy, and it's not the same time every day, and we don't have our cushion to meditate on. No, when, when we're pulled and whipped, I feel it every day. I feel it's interesting because every day, sometime during the day, I don't know when it is, but there's a moment, I've started to expect it, where like a sneeze or you know a shiver, uh, a little bubble of fear grabs me. And I gotta, that's when I gotta practice so it doesn't overtake me and spin out. And you know, over the week, last weekend, there was one day I couldn't get rid of it. I, it was with me almost all day. Um, I just kept trying to get rid of it and, I, and you know, and so it was a tough day. But this is, this is our practice of, which I talk about in quote, normal times, uh, as everybody has to have a practice of return that when we fall down, we get up. When we get afraid, we recenter. You know, when we're confused, we settle so we can see through to what is. And anything that helps us personally, we have to fill our own toolbox and try it out in real time. You know, one of the, one of the, uh, so, and we're not going to do it cleanly. I'm not doing it cleanly or mess. It's messy. But when I'm afraid, I need to touch into those deep roots. How? Well, by being still, if that doesn't work, by talking to someone I love, by listening to a favorite piece of music, by reading that poem that I've always returned to, um, you know, of Tu Fu from the sixth century over the years, anything. And, you know, it makes me think of, of you know, Beethoven, who, <clears throat> who, to me, of course, he was such a genius, but he was an ordinary person carrying an extraordinary gift. And he, he did this amazing quartet for uh, strings that uh, mo most of these, I think it was a concerto, and, and most of them were four movements. Well, he, did, he wrote one that was seven. And in music, there are rest stops, little pauses. And professional especially string instrument musicians will use those pauses to retune because you can't play four movements without going out of tune. Well, he not only did it seven, but he had no pauses. 
And everybody of the time had a hate love relationship. They were like, what is he thinking? I wonder if I can do it. And what he was saying, I mean, what I didn't talk to Beethoven, but what I am touched by and what I think he was saying is, you know what? You tune as you go. It's not going to be perfect. You, you make the most you can with what you have and you tune as you go. And that's what kind of we're being asked to do that in a big way right now. Mm -hmm. I think, Mark, one of the things you're pointing to that I want to highlight is someone like you, someone who's written 20 books <laughs> on the depth of the inner life, can get caught up in the pandemic of fear. And you write about how the virus of fear is as contagious and dangerous in its own right and in its own way differently than the COVID-19 virus that mm, many yes. of us. And so there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, one of the things though that I wanted to highlight is how when you get caught up in fear, it doesn't sound like you turn against yourself. Like you don't say, you know, God, I've been practicing for so long. I've been writing for so long. Look, I, I, I was supposed to be prepared for this time. I'm a person of this time. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't. And so how do you help people who have that motion where they turn against themselves? Like, you know, I should be doing better right now. Well, this, this speaks, and again, this speaks to things that we're getting a chance to practice in real time. And one of, one of them is, um, you know, we live in a culture that suffers from uh, excess and erroneous judgment. Judgment's, judgment's not helpful because it, it's not specific. It doesn't, you know, if I say you're good, you feel good, and then, okay, I don't know anything. If, you, if I say you're bad, uh, you feel bad, but you still don't grow or know anything. And so when we judge ourselves, we're really just removing ourselves from the moment. I think life is course correction steerage um and that's the practice that never goes away and um and yes i'm i um you know i have humbly accepted that wisdom doesn't exempt us from the journey it just supports us so it doesn't matter how much wisdom or how much i've studied or how many books i've written i'm the same two inches from fear i've ever been i i, I might be able to respond to it differently because I have that support, but it, it just puts me in a deeper hole to judge myself for it. And I think that, you know, this fear, this contagion of fear, and it really echoes, it's interesting because I mean, you know that, you know, over 30 years ago, I almost died from a rare form of lymphoma. And what we're going through collectively has echoed a lot of things I went through individually, emotionally, uh, as a cancer patient and th that I learned about fear and and you know one is that um, that th there's just a roller coaster every day is a roller coaster that in normal times we may go through moods more gradually but when we go through adversity or intense times they, that gets acute and now we're going up and down in more extreme ways and so we have to kind of accept that and know that we're going to be jostled and it's okay uh but we just have to keep finding a way to keep balancing back to center but the thing the other thing about fear and we've had to make it a practice susan and i here at home is um when i was going through my cancer journey even well-intentioned good do good doctors and nurses and i had both good and not so good and everybody spoke beyond what they know. Hmm. So there I was as the patient, I need information, I need accurate information. Where are we? What do the next few steps look like? And then beyond that, it's not helpful because then everybody just took guesses. They either made guesses that I would be well in such an extreme way that I couldn't take it seriously, or they painted doomsday scenarios and that i feel is exactly what's happening a lot collectively you know we turn on the news and we've had to make a practice so when I, back then i had to make a practice of i need to discern what's actual information and beyond that i, I don't need to hear it right now it's not helpful 
It's not helpful because no one knows. So it raises two things for me. One is, you know, we're watching the news. It's like we hear, okay, we want to hear what's happening. Is anything different? Anything changing? What do we need to know? And then beyond that, even the newscasters, uncomfortable with their own uncertainty, they start talking about fear. But rather than owning their own fear, then they start spinning doomsday scenarios. It's the only difference is instead of Susan and I wondering at home, they got a camera on them. So that's not helpful. So we've had to say, okay, we, we can only listen, you know, after six or seven at night, we're not gonna listen to anything because even if it is accurate, it's too upsetting to be able to sleep. So we think about when we're gonna check in with the world. And then we're discerning with our own kind of emotional sifters, what's real information and what is just perpetuating fear? What is the virus of fear? And, and that's become a, you know, kind of a daily practice because I think, again, it's very heightened, but in normal time, we in the modern world um, are so uncomfortable with the unknown that we would prefer a dark certainty to a neutral unknown. We are so anxious, you know, Kierkegaard said, you know, anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Our dis not, not the kind of anxiety like um, going mm -hmm. to the dentist, but yeah. that, that where's my ground? What's going on? You know, I imagine birds when they first start to fly. Nobody, they didn't know they were supposed to fly. As soon as they start to fly, it's wait a minute. What is this? What, I'm going down. I'm going up. What am I supposed to do? Somebody's flapping at me. Oh, flap, flap. Oh, Anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. So in addition to the legitimate fear of sickness and death and pain, we have this added anxiety because we don't know what to do with the unknown. And of course, the first thing is to admit we, that we're uncomfortable with it. No, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to know, yeah, I'd like to know when I'm going to be able to get back out and be with the people I love to teach and be with, I, but I don't know. I'm not going to know no matter how many times I go over it in my head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, Mark, I want you to address right now the person who's listening who right in this moment feels afraid. Right in this moment. Maybe they feel afraid because they have a COVID-19 diagnosis or they mm -hmm. think they do and they can't get a test or they know someone who does and they're fearful for their loved one, their friend. How can they work with their fear right now? Oh, well, first off, my heart goes out to anyone listening who's struggling with fear, and we all are, and whatever of those situations that you described, Tammy. And, I, and, I, and I, of course, I don't have answers. I can just share examples and things from my own experience. And again, it brings me back to my fear when I was in the midst of my cancer journey, and people were telling me I was going to die. And I was facing surgeries and chemo and in the midst of chemo. And, um, and the only thing that, that I could do was return to the moment I was standing on. No matter whether it was painful, it was known and solid. And so the only thing I think that we can do is return to that solid moment, however small it is, because when we can find that solid foundation, we connect beyond us into the foundation of everything. Whether we understand it or not, you know, a mountain, if we see from a distance, stands up, it looks majestic. But as we get closer, that mountain is, is standing on the earth. And you can't tell where the mountain stops and the earth begins. And the only thing that makes it majestic is its deeper foundation that's not seen. So by standing where we are, even when it's painful and fearful, we return to something that's solid and known and start again from there. Because fear, even legitimate fear, I've learned gets its power from the future and the past. That is, I'm in pain, I'm afraid, I'm hurting. Um, and now my big fear is like, well, is this never gonna end? What's the future going to be? Is it going to be worse or, or from the past? I've been through something terrible, you know, like my cancer journey. Will that return? Will it come back again? So 
even when things are difficult, the safest, most solid place is where we are. And when we come back to that place, and this leads into the other kind of, you know, the wonderful Buddhist, you know, notion and practice of trying the most difficult and simple thing <laughs> of all, the practice of seeing things as they are. And again, not beating ourselves up because as human beings, we naturally inflate and deflate our circumstances and our sense of ourselves. So it's that steerage back. Oh, okay. Recognizing the work of self-awareness. Oh, I've made this big. It is big, but I've made it bigger than it is. Okay, let's bring it back. Okay. And then when I, when it, however briefly, if I can see from where I am, things as they are, then I have real choices. You know, my father, who you know, he's gone now, but he was a master woodworker and he loved the sea and he built the 30 foot catch that I spent a lot of my youth on. And as a boy, he must have sensed that I had this unusual ability to pay attention, you know. So when we would be in a fog, he'd put me at the tiller of the sailboat to sail by a compass, a directional compass. And I learned really, anyone who sailed will recognize this, that um, one, even when you're on course, well, that compass needle never stands still. You, even when you're on course, you have to constantly steer a, li oh, a little to the left, a little to the right. And I th I've come to see that as a great metaphor for, for our daily spiritual practice, which is heightened, of course, in times of adversity. It's never done. Hmm. There's a quote, Mark, that I, I read from some of your recent writing during this, this time that acceptance disempowers fear. And I wanted to ask you about that because I wanted to understand more what kind of acceptance. I could imagine somebody who's thinking in their mind, yeah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm telling everybody, I'm afraid. That's not exactly disempowering fear. In fact, I'm telling everyone how afraid I am. What's the type of acceptance that disempowers fear? Well, again, this goes back to what I learned from almost dying. And, you know, I just was no wisdom on my part. I was just whipped around, turned inside out and upside down and came out with a different lens of perception. So it goes back to the big acceptance that we will die, that I don't want to die. I'm not ready to die. But when I'm afraid, all fear goes back to the big fear. Uh, I'm not going to be here. And so when I can accept that, not accept it as like, oh, I'm going to go out and walk in front of a car or I'm going to go to the store now regardless. And so if I catch it, so what? No, but acceptance at a deep level that I am impermanent. I am a steward of a portion of universal spirit for the time that I'm here, whether that be three years or a hundred years. And as soon as I start to accept that, um, then it also brings up how precious what we have is. And of course, I'm still going to be afraid. I don't want to catch the virus. I don't want to be in danger. But I have found that when I can, however, and again, these are not permanent acceptances. This is just like the steering. But when I can breathe deeply and say, well, my greatest fear, I'm going to catch this and, and I'll be sick and I'll die. And then when I can accept briefly, yeah, I'm going to die. It may not be now. It may be years from now. Then it returns me to that all of life is right where we are. And, and then I have found then the fear lives in me rather than me in the fear. It's somehow the practice of acceptance of our true position in life, which, you know, if we freeze these, then we get into whole partial philosophies. If we freeze, oh, we're all going to die, then it's nihilistic, it's existential, it's dark. It's, yeah. And if we freeze it, you know, well, no one can deny that they're not going to die. But if we put it off in a place where we don't want to look at it, then everything's wonderful and it's all, you know, a beautiful panacea. But life never stops moving. And of course, all things are true. So our practice or my practice, um, if, and of course, I don't want to die. I'm not ready to die. I'm you know, and doesn't mean like, oh, I'm all of a sudden everything's cool, forget it, you know, don't worry about it. No, but it right sizes and makes, reminds me of how precious and that everything I could want is really where I am, you know, really where I am, wherever that is. That even, you know, 
you know, Hippocrates said, pleasure is the absence of pain. So even if you're in pain as you're listening to this, even if you're in fear as you're listening to this, there, just like in quantum physics, there are spaces between the particles. There are always spaces, however small, between our fear and our pain. And we have to become great students of how to find them, then rest in them in the midst of our pain and our fear. You know, Mark, there's uh, so much I love about being your friend and about having a chance to connect with you. And I want to take a moment to talk to people who at this time might feel disconnected to other people in a way that's uncomfortable for them and longing to connect. Like, you know, I kind of want to call that person, but I don't think I'm going to. Or I don't know if I really have it in me to, you know, get on the Zoom call and do this thing. This longing to connect, but not really sure how to do it or if it's going to be worth it. Or what, 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 what do you have to say to that person? Well, my, my uh, encouragement is, again, back to, you know, tune as you go um, from Beethoven is uh, it's going to be messy and we're being asked to take risks and we need to stretch. And so, you know, um, I remember during the last summer, I was interviewed by a young woman, a wonderful young woman for a journal in London, and she was talking about the epidemic of loneliness in their generation and asked me if I had any advice. Well, I don't. You know, every, but but what came to my heart immediately was you don't interview ambulance drivers. You take the first one that comes along. If you're longing and it's hurting not being in contact with others, yeah, call someone up, zoom someone. You, you know, and if it feels uncomfortable, stop hesitating. And so, what if you do it awkwardly? So, what if you? It, it doesn't, so this is the other thing that, that judgment and preferences do to us, which we are just overwhelmed with preferences in our modern world. They insulate us from action. They insulate us from following our heart. The word trust literally means follow your heart. So if, you know, because it, does it, if I tell you I love you, do, do you care if I cough I love you or if I sing it in perfect pitch? No. So, if you're lonely, say you're lonely. If you need to reach out to someone, reach out to someone. And um, because the authentic, uh, you know what, this, okay, let me read a poem. Sure. Yeah, this is from The Way Under the Way, which I'm so, so grateful for, because I'm saying that, but people who are listening, it's, my book of poems published by Sound True, 20 years of poems. Um, amazing for any poet. <laughs> this is called If You Want a True Friend. If you want a true friend, just open your hands and say, I don't know. Say it softly and wait so your other can see that you mean it. Give them a chance to drop what they think is secret. Let them come up with a cup of what matters from the spring they show no one. Let them sigh and admit that they don't know either. Then you can begin with nothing in the way. Go on, admit to the throb you carry in your heart and let the journey begin. Beautiful. Well, thank okay. You. <laughs> One more question for you, Mark, and then maybe uh, we'll end with another poem. Uh, in your recent writing, a hard to grasp lesson that light must move as quickly as dark. Tell mm. us what you mean by that. Well, I, I, I was sitting here, you know, at home, of course, um, thinking about how, you know, just think, thinking that of all the things under all of our buzz and our world culture and global commerce and everybody running here and there and thinking they're behind and missing and falling short, under all of that in the microscopic fabric of life, somewhere in China, quietly, silently, an atom shifted in relationship to the atoms near it and this coronavirus was born. 
and then they're spreading so quickly all over the globe. And it made me feel it's always been this way. And it's that the yeah, light has to, uh, has to move as quickly as dark. Love has to move as quickly as disease. And that's why we can't hesitate. And that's why we can't hesitate to call, because even, because every soul on earth is a cell in the global body. And the global body is only as healthy as the healthy cells. So while we're struggling in terms of our physical health, our spiritual health, the roots of that global tree matter. And so every time that you do reach out, light and love and giving are moving. We have to move as quickly as disease and dark. Give has to move as quickly as take. And that demands that we risk. That demands that each of us, me too, um, I have found the greatest lessons of giving in my life have come when I have been asked to give when I thought I had no more left to give. And I've always been astounded and humbled at all that's there because the heart is really bottomless. It's just, yeah. And let's uh, close, Mark, with the poem. Uh, I love this poem, Coming Up for Air. Okay, let me... Um, here, I do have it on paper, so let me read it from this piece of paper. Oh, no, I don't. Okay, I'll read it from the, I've got it here. Coming up for air. Yeah, this is obviously a new one. The times are hard and unexpected. They always are. But the river of being that carries us is always life-giving if we can reach it. But this has ever requires diving where we are, not running from what is. We must be brave and must beware mostly of ourselves. For the mind is like a spider, it will weave many webs. But the heart is like an arrow of light, it will pierce a hole in the dark that life will fill. Along the way, we stumble in the dark, our fierce and tender honesty, the lamp we swing between us. Hmm. You know, I, I wanted to actually ask you a, a question sure. uh, about a line in that poem. The mind is like a spider. It will weave many webs. I think most people get that. They're in the cobwebs of their mind. <laughs> they, they get that. The heart is like an arrow of light. It will pierce a hole in the dark that life will fill. What would you say to that person who's listening right now at the end of our conversation and they want to connect with that part of their heart, that capacity in their heart that is like an arrow of light? How do they do it? All, all the things we've been talking about, about being present, re returning to what is, holding nothing back, not hesitating when you want to call or say or voice what's in your heart, even if no one's around. You know, instruments... You know, sheet music isn't music isn't sheet music. It's music, and what's in our heart needs to be voiced, uh, even when we're alone. Because voicing your soul and your heart will bring you in touch with that arrow of light. There is a difference to saying uh, what is true and what's in your heart versus thinking it. You don't have to have anyone there to hear it because you're there to hear it. So this is a time to cultivate out loud our relationship with our heart and our soul so that those roots can deepen so that when the winds sway the branches, even break a few branches, the tree doesn't come down. Thank you so much, Mark. It's uh, good medicine talking to you. Oh, it's always great medicine to be with you. Mark Nepo, author of more than 20 books with Sounds True, several books and audio programs, including his collection of poems over 20 years, The Way Under the Way, and a new book called Drinking from the River of Light. Thank you, Mark, for being part of our resilience and challenging times and bringing these arrows <laughs> of light from your heart. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you and everyone, it sounds true.
Soundstrue.com, waking up the world. Thanks for being with us.